with Antoinette Smith, Campus Coordinator, Western Campus, Mr. Raymond Martin, Mr. Evan Thompson, our expert panel for today, Mr. Carlton Henderson, Project Coordinator this morning, students, viewers, ladies, and gentlemen. Climate change is an urgent issue affecting planet Earth. It has the potential to affect future generations if decisive actions are not taken. What or who is responsible for this? Humans, of course. We burn fossil fuel, deforest, and release greenhouse gases into the atmosphere through industrial processes. After all, we must live. We must prosper as a people, regardless of geographic location. The innate desire for survival of humans cannot be tamed. How can we preserve the planet and still live the life we desire? How can we preserve the planet for our children's children to perish, especially to developing countries and small, vulnerable countries? When you take a country like my country, St. Vincent and the Grenadines, 134 square miles, a wind just has to the tail end of the wind just have to touch my country and we will buckle. It is a terror. And I believe sooner or later it may be labeled as such because of this devastating effect and this damage. Financial, social, economic, psychological, this damage it leaves behind. It is a terror on us. At this time, I take the opportunity to introduce our panel. Mr. Evan will join us online. By the way, I am Dr. Audrey Giddens. I hope you can hear me. Yes, just a moment, I, 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 I forgot our coordinator for this event, the series of events, Mr. Henderson, School of, of Mathematics and um, Statistics, and he will tell us why he's a Thank you, everybody. I, mean, I will ask you, why are you here? <laughs> But I want to give you a big picture of what we're trying to achieve here, and I'm really heartened by your, you coming out to give your support and to participate in what we're trying to um, achieve. Good morning again, uh, Jada. So, there are many social, political, and environmental issues that are currently that currently challenges our nation, and by extension, our world. These include but not limited to, lottery scamming, crime and violence, substance abuse, vote buying, corruption, poor parenting, global warming, etc. Just to name a few. Alright? Real reckoning is a response to these challenges. It is a call to action by our young people to become more socially, politically, and environmentally aware of the pertinent issues that affect our shrinking global scene. It aims to engage our young people in discussion in a data-driven environment, free from misinformation and disinformation, guided by professionals, like Mr. Martin here and Mr. Evan Thompson, with the relevant experience 
and expertise. It is hoped that re the Read Reckoning series will motivate our young people to become agents of change. They will join grassroots non-profit organizations or start their own organizations, non-profit organizations, and lead us into a desirable future for the 21st century. In our inaugural series, we have covered camming, parenting, and now climate change, reaching young people here at the campus, the Western campus, surrounding high schools, and the Women's Center. In the upcoming academic year, 2024-2025, we will be covering topics such as gender and sexuality, and I look forward to seeing all of you, I need some more. Um, substance abuse by teenagers, and Jamaica's constitutional reform, among other topics. We also hope to expand our reach to more high schools in the West, and eventually on a national level, because we see this as a necessary part as in your development, and in young people's development, and we want to get the word out to everybody, right? The, challenge, the challenges before us are great, and we will not achieve our goal of making Jamaica a place to, do, to live, to do business, and raise families until we get our young people to buy. We measure our success partly by the excitement we are able to generate in the minds of our young people, but primarily the number of young people who will eventually take up leadership roles in their households and in their communities. On, on the topic of today, climate change is the greatest threat that the planet faces in the 21st century. Yet, many of our young people are unaware, confused about the human con role or contribution towards global warming and the greenhouse gases, or how they can reduce their carbon footprint. This is due in part to climate denial, the spread of conspiracy theories, um, through misinformation and disinformation via social media news. We aim to dispel these myths today and set the record straight with our expert presenter. Thanks for coming, and we look forward to your participation in the question and answer session. Thank you very much, Mr. Henderson. So our panel will present, and then you will ask all the questions after. Mr. Raymond Martin, please sit down. Okay, joining us online, and you will be our first presenter, Mr. Evan G. Thompson. So do I go ahead? No, Mr. Thompson is currently <laughs> the principal director of the Meteorological Services Branch in the Ministry of Economic Growth and Job Creation. He has been a professional meteorologist for over 30 years since receiving his undergraduate degree from the Cave Hill Campus of the University of the West Indies in Barbados. Mr. Thompson became the head of Jamaica's Meteorolo Meteorological Service in 2016. In that capacity, he oversees operations of the organization's weather services, where the monitoring of meteorological conditions is done at the surface and in the upper atmosphere and climate services, where a database of Jamaica's climate is maintained. Among his chief roles is that of severe weather or hurricane for forecaster, where he manages the process of forecasting and warming of major hydrometeorological hazards for Jamaica, along with the communication on these hazards to the political directory and the general public. 
Evan Thompson was previously known as a senior broadcast meteor meteorologist on the main local television television station primetime news program where he served for over 17 years. In 2016, Mr. Thompson was appointed the permanent representative of Jamaica to the World Meteorological Organization, a specialized agency of the United Nations. He was later in 2021 elected for a four year term as president of his regional association of member states in North America, Central America and the Caribbean. And he currently serves voluntarily in that position. In that capacity, he sits on the executive council of the WMO and oversees several committees and expert teams within the region, including the highly respected Hurricane Committee, which has the responsibility for the naming of tropical storms and hurricanes and the coordination of tropical cyclone activity for the Atlantic Basin. Evan Thompson is also very involved in his church and his former high school occupying senior leadership roles. He's also a family man married with two sons. Welcome to Evan. Thank you, thank you very much, Mr. Gibbs. Um, I am at such a huge disadvantage not being able to see all of you, but I hope you're able to see me, and I hope you're also able to hear me clearly. Um, can you give me some indication? Yes. Yeah. Okay. All right. It is my pleasure to be with you, but I must apologize for not being there in person. I really had wanted to be there, but um, the schedule just was not allowing it, and the preparation time and, and getting there, it just was not being able to be accommodated at this time. So unfortunately, I'm not there in Montego Bay, but I am happy to be joined here on this platform. Um, I am going to be sharing some information with you. I'm just a little bit um, scared, however, that I might be infringing on Mr. Martin's territory. Um, I'm not too sure, you know, where we will um, overlap in terms of some of the things that we will share. But I will go ahead anyway and share um, what I have. Um, hopefully, I will not infringe um, too much. Um, but let me um, let me share my presentation. I'm hoping that you'll be able to see what I share here. Uh, let me find it and make sure that it is available to you. Give me one second here. All right. Okay, I hope you are able to see that. Let me get it to the. Are you able to see that presentation? Yes, we are. Yes, we are. Okay, great. All right, so we're here, and as, as was mentioned before, we're here talking about climate change, preserving the planet for the next generation. And you know, I'm saying we, we are really in unusual times. It's, a, it's, it's times that probably we had not seen many, many years ago. Um, and sometimes we are thrown some difficult situations, but we just have to make do with what we have, the resources we have, and see how we can deal with these situations. Um, my being here in Kingston while you're in Montego Bay is one of those um, things, but uh, of course climate change is another one of these things, um, which is of a much greater uh, magnitude that we'll be talking about today. Um, one of those things that we just have to deal with. Now when I was growing up in school, um, we were always taught what the weather is and what climate is. The weather being the state of the atmosphere at any point in time and at any point in space. Um, and so we've gone about um, considering, you know, how we look at day-to-day -day weather conditions and, you know, we describe them in certain ways. And it was always felt that weather changes um, quite a lot. And over the, a period of a long-term period, when we amalgamate the conditions of the weather, we then consider that climate, general pattern of weather conditions for a region over a long period of time. So we talk about a general pattern 
looking at the various changes that take place from time to time with regard to the weather. But we were always told while I was going to school that the climate doesn't change, it's the weather that changes. But then as I have come to, to understand at this point in time, there is, there is a changing of the climate. And the climate, first of all, we talk about climate variability, which really is a temporary change. And it is periodic. Um, from time to time, changes occur with our climate. Things happen that are somewhat unusual. Um, we have set patterns, but then some things change those patterns from time to time. And so we realize that the climate does change, but it will always come back to center. So it would be a temporary change, and it, it is period, but it is temporary. So it reverts to what is the normal climate um, over time. But now we're understanding that there is another kind of change that is taking place. It's not a variability in the climate, but it is a change in the climate where the, the, the start point is changed. And we're moving to a new norm where climate conditions are concerned. And that is a statistically significant variation in either the main state of the climate or in the variability. And it persists for an extended period. Um, it may be decades, it may be longer, it might be forever if nothing is done to change that cycle or that pattern and cause us to revert to what we were accustomed to in previous years. So we have learned that it's not just the weather that changes. Climate change is, it changes in a temporary way but there is also a more permanent change that takes place that we refer to as the climate change. Now looking at Jamaica's climate, I mean, you know, we talk about the bimodal pattern of our rainfall in particular. Um, of course, rainfall is not the only thing that distinguishes our climate because the temperature also has a lot to do with it. We're in a tropical uh, part of the globe, and so we experience tropical weather. We experience certain temperatures that are not experienced at the poles. And uh, our weather is less, or, or temperatures are less variable than they are in temperate regions or farther from the equator. Now, what we're looking at here now in terms of this pattern is really the rainfall pattern, where we are now in the month of March, and March would normally signify where we have the least amount of rainfall in any given year. Looking at the pattern um, of rain of rainfall over the period of 30 years from 1971 to 2000. This is what I'm showing you here. Um, so if March would normally show the, 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 should I say, the peak of the dry season or really the, the, the trough of that dry season that we are experiencing at this time. We are in the dry season and this is usually the time when you have the least amount of rainfall. But after we move from March, we have an increase in April and then we move to a peak that would occur in May. That is really what we call our secondary peak of rainfall. And then the primary peak occurs in October, as you can see on this chart, with another low occurring in July. So the period between the May and the October would normally be referred to as our rainfall season, could you call it that? I mean, as it goes through the summer. But it does have a, a trough in the middle in July. And then we have the, the real primary peak that occurs in October, where we get the most rainfall. And then it falls again as we move into the dry season that continues until March or April. So that's what our usual pattern of climate is. We recognize, however, in Jamaica that some of this is changing. We are actually putting together, as we speak, some of that detail. And I understand that in just a few weeks, we will have what is our, our latest climatological mean or, or normal, which would move from 1991 to 2020. So that is what we are looking to develop at this point in time. And we are already seeing a trend where a lot of these variables are changing. Rainfall patterns are changing. We'll see the peaks and troughs in a little bit different way than we've seen it in the past. And we're also seeing that there are changes that are taking place with respect to temperature. I just wanted to point out some of the what we've been seeing in terms of temperature. And this is prior. Now, this is looking at the previous normals, as I mentioned, the 71 to 2000, because the next one hasn't been released yet. But this is what the temperatures in Kingston and Montego Bay normally look like, where you have it increasing from January, going up to about July and August, and then lowering. Of course, we know in the summer period, we have our highest temperatures, and that would be in the June, July, August period, and then we move down 
into December and January where the temperatures are lowest. And it is the same for much of the country and of course um, Montego Bay just as much as in Kingston. Um, when we look at the rainfall patterns, we're seeing um, there is a, a mean that was established, we, we saw in, in 2016, in 2017, 18, 19, but then there is the 30-year average that you see in all the green line here that is really, uh, you know, what we, we see as our mean over time, but some of these are the, the years as we move through. So you see it varies um, in relation to the mean as we move along the the, through the year. But the mean temp, um, rainfall pattern is what we showed with the peaks that we, we showed in the previous slide, and that's the green um, boulder line that we're seeing on this chart. So we, we, we recognize that there is climate change taking place. We know that there are a number of causes. There are reasons why there is a change in the climate. I, I presume that that will be discussed a little bit more by Mr. Martin because we didn't consult. We don't know what each other is going to be speaking exactly about, uh, but we, the, the causes of climate change, we'll, we'll, um, we'll take a, a brief look at that. But then there are the effects. There are the things that cause it, but then there are the effects that will take place or that have been taking place because of that change in the climate. And then what is the evidence that we see of this change? Yes, the change is happening. The, the effects are taking place, but what is the evidence that we have on the ground? And there are some examples of that as well. So looking first up at the cause, here we see on the left-hand side of our screen, the natural greenhouse effect. You know, you have a, a greenhouse effect that takes place that keeps us warm, generally, in our atmosphere. Um, and so we would expect the solar radiation to come in. We expect that the earth is going to be um, warm, but we also expect that it will, all, that it will um, radiate some of the heat into the atmosphere. And, um, and so there is the heat that is occurring in our atmosphere that is keeping us warm. Some of it, however, does escape into, into space, um, but there is that cushion area around the earth that constitutes our atmosphere. But on the right-hand side of our picture, we see where a lot of human-induced climate change or greenhouse effect is taking place. That's where climate change comes in because we are emitting a lot of, of, of chemicals, a lot of gases into the atmosphere. That is changing the composition of the atmosphere and it is reducing what is actually being able to escape from the atmosphere. So we're seeing a lot of trapping of air of, of warm air within the atmospheric region, and that is causing the global um, warming to take place, and that is what is moving toward a climate change. So apart from the warming, we're seeing that other variables of climate are also being impacted, and that is occurring right across the globe. In some areas, we're seeing more dramatic impacts, while others are quite less dramatic. So that is what has been taking place. You have the solar radiation coming in quite a bit, coming in, maybe more is coming in because of course there is ozone depletion. And, and so with that coming in and then with the radiation of all these greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, there's that trapping of the heat. So we're getting all those effects that we mentioned earlier. So the greenhouse effect is what is taking place. So we're seeing an increase in extreme weather events, we're seeing increased rainfall intensity. All of these are impacts that we expected from climate change, and we are actually seeing much of that taking place in our atmosphere at this time. Increased rainfall intensity, there are landslides that are taking place because of the flooding events. Um, we're also seeing increases in air temperature, we're seeing hotter days, we're experiencing warmer nights. We have health concerns, re vector borne diseases, and that is because of some of the changes in the temperature that we're also seeing um, water resources being impacted. We're seeing um, loss of livelihoods and ecosystem services. Sea level is rising, of course, because of the melting of glaci um, the, the ice caps and the glaciers in polar regions, and that is increasing the volume of water in the atmosphere, and that, of course, leads to an increase in sea surface temperatures. There is saline intrusion because with that increase in sea surface temperatures, there's more salt water being infiltrated into our aquifers. And so the, the, the underwater, underground water is being impacted by salty water. 
um, coastal inundation with that sea, sea level rise, um, sea level temperature, sea surface temperatures are also increasing. There's water shortage, more frequent droughts because we have those, epi those, those longer dry periods. But with the rainfall episodes, they are usually more intense. We have been experiencing that, but it was also projected in climate change based on what we are um, expecting the atmosphere, how it is expected to change. So lots of these changes are taking place in our atmosphere. We've seen those impacts. In Jamaica, there are very many experiences of coastal erosion because of that sea level rise that we spoke about. Uh, we're hearing our fishermen speak about some of the beaches being lost not just the fishers, but also other residents, you know, who live in coastal areas will speak about the loss of those coastal areas because of the sea level rise. And so we're losing some of our beach, we're seeing more of the erosion, and um, there are so many other impacts that we see on the ground. There's talk about infiltration of the aquifers with, 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 um, with salt, wa salt water from the sea, and all that is impacting us even here in Jamaica. There are a number of reports that have been produced. You know, more and more we are monitoring what is taking place in our climate. And we are experiencing some of these changes um, locally, but we're also seeing reports that are um, being produced um, in a more global context. So some of, I, I was taking a look at the global climate for 2022, the state of the global climate and some of the highlights that came out of this report. One of them is that the global mean temperature in 2022 was 1.15 above the 1850 to 1900 average. This we talk about as the, the industrial age, the pre-industrial age. And so what we are seeing is that we are already seeing an increase of over 1.1 degrees. It's about 1.2 degrees almost that we're seeing an increase over those levels between 1850 and 1900. The years 2015 and 2022 were eight warmest, sorry, that's eight, 2015 to 2022, and that continued in 2023, were the warmest years on record. The year 2023, actually, um, in an update to this, has now been um, declared to be the warmest year on record, and every month, since about June or July, we've been hearing that that month has broken the record for the month um, in global records. So the last June was the warmest June, July was the warmest July, and it continued right through the year. And again, now starting in 2024, we've already heard that January and February are the warmest that we have ever experienced, warmer than it was last year and the year before, which were already breaking records. So we are experience that, experiencing that global um, warming that is taking place, and of course the, the climate change that um, is, is characteristic of that. So the concentrations also, the second point here, concentrations of three main greenhouse gases, those are carbon dioxide, methane, and nitrous oxide, reach record highs in 2021, um, and this was in the 22 report annual increase in methane concentration was the highest on record. Real-time data from specific locations show that levels of greenhouse gases continued to rise in 2022. And that was the concern of all. And you may have heard about the, the, the Conference of the Parties from the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. The latest um, session that was held last year, also, you know, the, the, this is, more discussion that is taking place about where we have reached with respect to the, the, the global climate and what needs to be done. So countries are being encouraged to do what they can to reduce those concentrations of um, the, 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 the gases that are disastrous to our climate and that are greenhouse gases. About 90% of the energy trapped in the climate by greenhouse gases goes into the ocean. We have warmer oceans that are more accepting of these gases being absorbed, and so we're seeing more acidic, acidic waters also, those are being experienced in our seas and oceans. Continuing in the report, it spoke about despite continuing La Nina conditions, the ocean surface experienced one marine heat wave in 2022. And last year we heard about the, the, the 
waters again continuing to be um, exceeding the expectations with heat and how it is causing um, disasters with respect to um, the ecosystems um, actually. Global mean sea level continue to rise. Um, we see in the hydrological year that is represented in this report a set of reference glaciers with long-term observations experience mass balance um, that reach minus 1.18 meters water equivalent. And this loss is larger than the average over the last decade. So we're seeing huge losses to the gla glaciers and of course increased water volume in our oceans. Mention was made of East Africa where the rainfall was below average in five consecutive wet seasons. We heard about record-breaking rain in July and August, especially and leading to extensive flooding that was in the in the Pakistan area. Numbers of deaths and costs associated with that. Record-breaking heat waves affecting China and Europe. All this was in 2022, and in 2023, there was not much change because we continued to hear about all these excesses and all the things that were, were happening to change our global climate. In Jamaica also, we conduct a state of the Jamaican climate. It's not done in the meteorological service, it's done by our academia, and that is usually published um, as soon as those are done. The latest one I have is the one in 2021, and that also spoke about some changes taking place in the Jamaican context with respect to temperature, where maximum mean and minimum temperatures showing an upward trend. There's average minimum temperatures increasing faster than the minimum than the maximum temperatures, um, and the mean temperatures increasing at a rate of 0 0.008 degrees per year. Of course, it might look like very little, but minimal changes in temperature have spin off greater changes in the global climate. There are increases in temperature that are consistent with the global rates that was determined in our Jamaican climate, the state of the Jamaican climate report. The daily temperature range has also decreased. So it, 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 there is, is a, a shorter space or um, the, the distance between the, the um, morning temperatures and the night temperatures um, that temperature change is really decreasing. Rainfall, we're also seeing changes in rainfall, significant year-to-year -year variability due to the influences of like the El Nino phenomenon. Um, and we know that um, many of us would know that the El Nino phenomenon was very active last year. Um, it reached a peak and it's now on the downscale moving toward neutral conditions. So El Nino also contributed to the increased temperatures and even the increase, um, well, in our area, it's really a decrease in the rainfall activity. So it increased the, the likelihood of drought and we experienced some very intense drought conditions even at the beginning of last year. Last year, this time, we were in those drought conditions. There is an insignificant, an insignificant upward trend with rainfall. So it's not seen that there is any significant change to, in the positives with respect to rainfall on the year level. Only in episodes we are seeing where there is heavier rainfall in episodes, in particular downpours. There's a strong decadal trend with wet anomalies in the 60s, early 80s, late 1990s, and the mid to late 2000s, where there's a dry anomaly that was in the late 70s, mid and late 80s, and post-2010. So there are just some signals that were detected in that report. Um, it spoke about rainfall zones, but I'm going to move forward to the sea levels. An average regional rate of increase was detected between 50 and 2009, and the extent of it is seen here up to about um, 1.8 plus or minus a millimeter per year seen during that period, and a higher average rate of increase in later years going up to 2010, between 1993 and 2010. The Caribbean sea level changes are near the global mean, and we're hearing global um, sea level changes are where there is an increase. The sea level range at Port Royal was about 1.66 millimeters per year, um, that detected by sensors in that area. So we're seeing where the, there is evidence being seen in the Jamaican context of changes, 
hurricanes increase in categories four and five, hurricanes in our region, rainfall intensity, associated peak week intensities, mean rainfall for the same period, um, majority of storms or hurricanes impacted Jamaica are categories three and four, and this is over a period of time, um, but in recent years. So those changes are also being seen. Now, many of the, the much of the information that we are getting, whether in the global context or in the Jamaica context, is reported on by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Because although climate change has taken on a kind of different um, image um, globally, it's more seen as um, in, in not so much looking at the, the data and what is happening to the actual climate, but more in terms of how it is impacting life, even at the social level. Um, that's how it is being looked at, and of course it's seen as a big way of, of, of moving money around, and so a lot of money is being pumped into the climate change agenda, you know, that, that we, we're looking at. But we always have to look back at the science and what is really seen, what is the evidence on the ground of the changes that are taking place. So the IPCC is responsible for that scientific um, investigation and reporting and this is done at those same COP meetings that I mentioned earlier, the Conference of the Parties. So it, it, it looks at, is the United Nations, the, the IPCC is the United Nations body for assessing the science related to climate change. The IPCC provides regular assessments of scientific basis of climate change, the impacts and future risks, and the options for adaptation and mitigation. And the IPCC's findings um, from the assessment informs the UNFCCC, UNFCCC negotiations process, and that's where the COP comes in. I should point out that the focal point for the IPCC in Jamaica is actually located in the Meteorological Service. Mrs. Jacqueline Spence Hemmings, who is the climate, um, the head of our climate services section, she is actually the focal point where climate change matters are concerned um, for reporting to the IPCC. So there is a call to action, really. We see these changes taking place. We see that it is affecting us. We see that it is not necessarily a positive thing for many of us in terms of how it is impacting our lives. And so it is important that we see what we can do to address the situation. And that's where we are now. How does the world address it in terms of mitigation activities? But also, how do we adapt what we are doing to deal with some of these changes that are taking place. So the IPCC report shows that we're already committed to a certain level of climate change, and we will be dealing with the effects for that for a long time to come. The momentum has already been built. Even if we stop emitting these disastrous gases into the atmosphere today, there will be a continuing effect of climate change for a period of time before we are able to stabilize our climate just because of the res residual effect. Um, of what is already um, taking place um, caused by this human-induced climate change and uh, what we are doing in our atmosphere. So climate-related risks for natural and human systems are higher for global warming of 1.5 degrees than at present, but lower than at 2 degrees Celsius. Now, there was a thrust in our region and, and across the world for us to try to limit our changes in temperature to 1.5 degrees above the, the um, industrial levels that we spoke of earlier going up to 1900s. And we're already at 1.2 approximately. 1.5 is not far off. Um, two degrees was what was kind of seen as a target, but we recognize that 1.5 would already be disastrous in terms of the impacts of climate change in our context. And so there has been a trust to keep it below 1.5. Of course, that is in jeopardy at this time based on how things have been changing. So these risks depend on the magnitude and rate of warming, the geographic location, levels of development and vulnerability, and on the choices and implementation of adaptation and mitigation options. So the, the, there's the call to action action is required now to adapt to the changes that are already occurring and that will continue to occur. But we also have a call to um, action
action that is required as we seek to achieve our goals nationally and even the, the, the wider goals in terms of strategic goals of our world um, to mitigate against future and further global climate change. So that is my presentation um, this morning. I hope it has been useful to you and I hope it opened some eyes to some of the things that we've been experiencing. Um, we'll shortly be releasing um, a new climate normal for Jamaica in another, um, within the next, within this year. Uh, we're hoping to do that at least for the rainfall and the temperature parameters to see how those have changed in the past 30 years and how that relates to the previous 30 year period that um, we had been looking at going up to the year 2000. Thank you very much and um, all the best for the rest of the presentation. Thank you very much, Mr. Thompson. That was an exceedingly insightful presentation, and I can tell you from my point of view, there were new learnings today. But as we say, every day is a learning day. Thank you very much. And now we have our second presenter. I hope you have been jotting down your questions. Yes, sir. Okay. <coughs> I'm sitting under the bench, so <laughs> figure my side out. Somewhat. <coughs> okay. Mr. Raymond Martin, sir. You having some challenge? He is a graduate of the University of the West Indies and holds an MPhil in zoology with specialization in entomology. He joined the UTEC staff in September, on September 1st, 2001. He's a lecturer of environmental studies. He has served as head of the Division of Biological Sciences and Environmental Science. He developed the syllabus for the IPCC, which is Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Guidelines for Agriculture Greenhouse Gases greenhouse gas inventories and accounting, and the farming system for livelihood sustainability modules, and was instrumental in the development of the online environmental studies module. He is a former chairman of the Jamaica Organic Movement. He is a trained inspector for organic crop production and livestock production. He was the technical secretary for the committee which developed the Caricom Code of Practice for Organic Produce. He was project manager for the Environmental Foundation of Jamaica funded project, which is the sustainable agroforestry systems supporting organic beekeeping and alternative livelihood. And the Global Environmental Facility Small Grants Program funded project, which was, which is, Sustainable ecosystem management to support agroforestry, agrotourism, and community development in vulnerable communities in Portland and St. Thomas. Ladies and gentlemen, present your second panel. So, thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Gittens, uh, Ms. Angela Smith, Mr. Henderson. Members of, the, Mr. Thompson, members of the audience, thank you for having me. I, I hear that there are members of the debating society here. Any debaters here? No debaters? No? Not one debater? Ah, okay. So I decided I was going to do this like a debate. So let us see how it goes. So climate change. So what I'm doing, a threat to life on Earth or fake news? So join with me. So we're going to look at the climate change debate. Um, we're going to look at evidence for climate change. We're going to look at history. We won't spend any time on that, so Mr. Thompson did that quite well. Who is responsible for climate change? Uh, what are some of the effects? Mr. Thompson did a lot of that. But I'm going to look at it from a different perspective, because I'm a biology person, and responses to climate change. All right, so what's climate change? 
Change in weather patterns. Change the atmosphere. Destruction of the atmosphere. So you, you, so you, you all think that climate change is happening. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Let's hear the first debate. <coughs> climate change is a myth. No. Climate cycles are quite normal. You heard about climate variability. You know, some spoke about climate variability. Yeah, you just go up and down, and yeah. So, and plus the climate has changed before, so it's no big thing. Let's not worry about it. All right. So here's the next presenter. It's not a myth. There are indeed natural cycles. For instance, remember Mr. Thompson spoke about El Nino and La Nino, La Nina, that these natural cycles occur. And uh, so this is what's happening right now. Um, course, this is the latest projection, February 2024. And uh, what they're expecting is that we're currently in an El Nino natural cycle, but the Earth. Yes, and the Earth also fluctuates between cold periods, known as ice ages. Um, so we have these 100,000 year fluctuations that do occur. But look at what? Today's, but look at what? Today's warming natural cycle. The Earth is currently at its hottest for what? 12,000 years, perhaps even 125,000 years. And one of the other challenges is the rate of warming is extremely rapid. So, so what is responsible for climate change? <coughs> Cutting down the trees and greenhouse okay. gases. Look at what the first debater says. The sun is getting hotter. <laughs> so according to him, the sun is getting hotter and therefore Earth is getting warmer. Next debater comes up and says, the sun is not getting hotter. In fact, the sun's energy has been decreasing. It has actually been decreasing since the 1980s. And when you examine it, the warmest part, in fact, the outer atmosphere is actually getting cooler. So why was it so hot in 2022? Come on. Global warming is not a natural phenomenon. (laughs) So uh, are you supporting the the, the first and the second? We looked at, we, 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 we looked at, I just want to show you, that's why it is getting hotter. So greenhouse gases, what is really happening is that we're emitting these gases into the atmosphere, so the sun's rays pass through and it warms the earth, but guess what? Because of these gases being present, they trap heat. That's why it's getting warmer. Because there's more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere from the burning of fossil fuels to trap the heat. So what we have is a continuous rise in temperature. Last year was the warmest year. Last year was, and, and this year is probably expected to be. This year is hotter. It's expected to be, yes. It's already started out being hotter. Mm-hmm. Can you imagine Feb, we, winter, the winter months, February, mm-hmm. going into March, and it was hot like summer. Mm-hmm. So we are, we are experiencing these, these, these changes. And of course, carbon dioxide contributes about 55% to the warming and methane about 30%. So these are the two main greenhouse gases. So you mentioned that it's caused by burning off fossil fuels, CFCs, chlorofluorocarbons. No, tell me something. What's the link between ozone depletion and global warming? So the ozone is like the protector of the earth in a sense, you know, protecting it, it prevents ultraviolet rays, yes, restric- restricts the amount of ultraviolet rays mm-hmm. coming in, yes. Mm-hmm. So no. When certain things happen, like, you know, the harmful things where they go on, the, the greenhouse gases, I guess all of that is like chipping away the ozone layer. In, in, to me, no. Nope. Me wrong? <laughs> <laughs> greenhouse gases do not affect the ozone layer. Okay, all right. Good, not so green. carbon dioxide does not affect the ozone layer. Okay, but the things that affect the ozone layer are chipping it, chipping it away so that the sun is coming to us more directly and we don't have a barrier between us and the sun. That's a strong enough. So, the ab- so CFCs, chlorofluorocarbons, you know, refrigerators, aerosol mm-hmm. sprays, that is reducing the amount of ozone. Mm-hmm. And uh, as so Thompson said that there's more radiation coming in because of the depletion of the ozone layer. So that might be increasing 
the, the, the whole one minute there. CFC itself, those are also greenhouse gases. But here's the interesting thing. Ozone is a greenhouse gas. So reducing the ozone is actually reducing, but adding CFC is increasing. But they expect that the net effect is really an increase due to the... So it, it's not that greenhouse gases cause ozone depletion, but there is a relationship between the two. Um, there is a relationship. So global warming is the overall warming of the planet due to the greenhouse effect, and uh, which has disabled the trapping of heat by gases. So it's human induced, we're talking about, because there is uh, water vapor in the atmosphere. So naturally present, and that has resulted in Earth being warm enough to support life. What's happening is that we are increasing the amount of greenhouse gases, which is causing the warming to increase. And it's increasing at such a rapid rate, it's affecting climate. And it's affecting the whole way the Earth system, all the systems that are being impacted because of it. So we have severe droughts, we have extreme flooding. The kind of interesting thing you know is that we, we all know the water cycle. When the sun's rays hit the earth or water on the earth, the earth, the water evaporates. And then as it gets goes up in the atmosphere, it cools and you have precipitation. It goes into the atmosphere, it's too warm. So what does it do? It moves further north or south. And so we have changes in rainfall. Some areas don't get any rain anymore uh, because of that. And this is impacting, uh, we spoke about the impact. Uh, per, we, one of the solutions to climate change is renewable energy, such as hydropower. But rivers are drying up. So there are countries that are dependent on, on, on rivers for hydroelectricity. I know Africa in particular had invested heavily in hydroelectricity. No, they're having a problem. They don't have enough water, and they don't have enough electricity. So they have a double challenge, challenge going on. All right, so let's see. Who should fix the problem? We are responsible. Yeah. Let's hear what the man says. Develop countries, of course. They are the ones who are burning more fossil fuels. So the EU and the US, they are the ones. All right, here's the next one. Okay, that's the best. This is, this is really a great debate. You know that China, United States, India, the 27 countries of the EU, Russia, and Brazil were the six world largest greenhouse gas emitters in 2022. They account for 50% of the global population, 61% of global gross domestic product, 63% of global fossil fuel consumption, and 62% of greenhouse gas emissions. Can you imagine? Is China a developed country? Is India a developed country? All right, yeah. China is interestingly debatable because China insists on being classified as a developing state. Why do you think so? There are incentives to being a developed nation, right? So I know why why I lose those incentives, but so China refuses to be classified as as developed because there are incentives to being a developing country. So even though they have mega projects and they're all over the world helping different countries with projects, they consider themselves developing. India is developing. So what they find is that the top two, India and China, in terms of the developing nation, they have been moving ahead with, with, with their development and that has been on the back of fossil fuel use. And so it's not just the US, and the, U and the EU will also have emerging economies. And there's this big debate where every time they go to a, a climate change meeting, it's like, okay, developing countries need to, developed countries must fix it, developed countries say, but hello, China, India, you need to do something about it too. And so there's this back and forth between the whole thing. So there are these uh, conventions. We have the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. Uh, you have seen where this is the body that does most of the climate studies and so on. There's a Paris Agreement in 20, 2016. And uh, sorry, this is too small, but under this, nice. countries are supposed to do um, projections on their greenhouse gas emissions. 
So they do these projections and they file it. So Jamaica has their um, nationally determined contribution. So they determine their contribution to emissions. So we are supposed to be, be, be looking at that. And uh, let's look at another question. Is it possible for a country to do without fossil fuels and reduce emissions? Yeah. Of course not. Renewable energy sources are way too expensive. Mm -hmm. And they take up too much space. Look how much solar panels. You know how much land we're going to need for solar panels. And you know how much land we're going to need for wind turbines and all these things. All right, here's the next one. In 2022, China, the United States, and India increased their emissions. Right? So we have an increase. But, 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 the EU 27 countries. The 27 countries of the EU reduced their emissions. How did they reduce their emissions? They emitted 8% less carbon. Yep. 8% less carbon dioxide. And this is the lowest level in 60 years. And this graph, if you notice that youth increase in the 2000s, but it has actually gone down to the lowest since 93, and it's projected to get lower. So it's impossible. And the, the decreases have occurred because of in increased investment in renewable energy plants. And the price, the cost for renewable energy is going down. It's actually going down. Due to continuing technology improvements. So no, it's not true that it is increasing. It is decreasing. So new off onshore wind and solar projects cost roughly 40% less than coal or gas plants. <coughs> Brazil, solar installations are expected to drop. They're driven by small scale plants of five megawatts or, or, or less. So Brazil is now the world's third largest solar market. This was in 2023. Behind China, China which is emitting the most, they also running ahead with, with, with renewable energy. So eventually you're gonna find that even China's emissions are gonna to start to fall as it kicks in. The impacts of climate change, you know the impact acts already. Um, oh, here's what the young man said. Climate change is nothing to worry about. Don't you like when surfing when the waves are high? The other day when we had all these waves and yes, Pier 1 was destroyed, but didn't you have fun in the surf? Yes. <laughs> It's too expensive to do anything anyway. So, so we're gonna have higher, higher temperatures. So of course, it's higher sea, ter sea temperatures will drive stronger, more powerful hurricanes. Frequent floods and droughts, bushfires, rising sea levels. So we have all of these as, as, as issues. What can we do? Nothing. The earth will eventually fix itself. And there's no great harm. Remember, we talk about the surfing, Hello, you just enjoy life, man. Don't for yourself. Ah, so there are two ways to address it. You have climate change mitigation and climate change adaptation. Mitigation reduces greenhouse gas levels. Adaptation really builds resilience. It's, it's, so this is what's gonna happen. Let us um, work around it to see how we can ensure that nothing bad happens. Reduce the damage. Find a way to reduce it. So there's a there. So we can look at ways to mitigate. So there is switching to renewable energy, uh, conserving, uh, planting trees. Uh, in terms of adaptation, so remember we said that if you're going to have droughts, then how if you, how you plan prepare for a drought? Then of course water harvesting systems. Uh, the Ministry of um, you notice that we now have the Ministry of Agriculture fisheries and you know what the, the next tag on to the ministry is? Mining. Mining. They want to turn those mined out pits into water harvest. Yeah. Into reservoirs. And that is adaptation. So they want to turn these lands into agriculture. That's why they, they, they put it under the umbrella. Uh, but you can also relocate, right? You can move to somewhere else. Uh, let's look at some case studies. And uh, let's look at from the species perspective. So warming temperatures, in response, that's gonna change habitats, right? Corals are bleaching. Uh, so species can migrate, or they can adapt, or they can go extinct. 
fish is actually going at extinct as we speak. Uh, 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 so these are happening. Coral bleaching. So let's hear from the coral reefs. So fish populations are being impacted. Not only are fish populations being impacted, but fishing and tourism, which are dependent on it, are also being impacted. The, the strong waves that we had the other day did serious damage. Serious damage to our infrastructure. Higher sea temperatures. You know that we have fish that is too warm for them to so they're migrating further north? Mm. Yep. Longer sea turtles. Do you know that the sex of turtles is dependent by the temperature? Mm. Yeah. So more turtles will be females because as the temperature increases, they're going to turn female. <laughs> I wonder if that's happening to human beings. Bring it to his fault. No, that. No, that. There will be a factor. The child's worst here, butterflies. No, that the child's worst here, butterflies. You know, it's only found in Cosmic Country and in the Blood Drunk Mountains because of the high humidity. So as it era dries out, they will not be able to survive. Conquer country, tree frogs live in the water in Rubinias, right? Rubinias are like pine. Yeah, you know, like the pine, pine up, uh, pineapple. Mm -hmm. uh, so they live inside the, 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 the hollow in the water. If it gets drier, they have no habitat. So we're gonna have that effect. Birds migrate. Now this is one of the biggest challenges. Bird migration is, birds are confused. So they, they, they're migrating too early because it's not warm enough to migrate. But when they reach, they find, when they reach further north, they find, hold a second, but snow still on the ground. <laughs> What's going on here? It was warm in, very hot in Jamaica when I left. Now I come back home and find the snow still on the ground. What is going on? The Yes. And combined with, with human impact. So, so did they. What did those birds have to fly up to Jamaica? No, they died. <laughs> they died. But they can't get enough food. So, they're migrating. The whole migration triggers are, 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 are messed up. And it usually creates. Bushfires are increasing. Look at, a, look at a map of wildfires worldwide, and you find that somewhere is on fire. I think somewhere in Central America, there's a, there's a circle of fire going on right now. Um, but all around the world, we have bushfires, right left and center. And so our forests, our trees are supposed to be capturing carbon dioxide, but they're all going up in fire. The, 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 the largest, one of the largest captures of carbon dioxide in the Tiger region, where you have all these coniferous forests, those are on fire. Every year, losing thousands of, we're not talking about little pieces of land, thousands of acres are going up in flames. And it, 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 it's, it's fascinating. Um, sea level rise mentioned that about the, it, 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 it's affecting, causing more flooding. Uh, so of course we know crocodiles. Crocodiles, we have decided to build our homes where crocodiles live. So the crocodiles are migrating into people's homes because the areas are flooded. Yeah, we have for water, we just walk into the yard and set up residence, no problem. Hurricanes, we know the effects of that. And uh, it's an interesting thing with mangroves. It's found that mangroves and coral reefs are moving further north in response to the changes that are, that are happening. So we know Hurricane Gilbert. Here's an interesting thing. As it gets warmer, some species that cannot tolerate warm conditions are being replaced by warm tolerant species. So destruction of uh, some of our native trees after a hurricane, they never return because they were replaced by invasive species. So we have that changing. So we're losing. We're biodiversity is, is changing. So the impact on ecosystem is increasing the effects of climate change. Or quarries, for example, they don't have time to adjust because we are overloading the system with sewage, solid waste. Um, diseases are increasing in the population. So the systems are not strong enough. It's the same thing with a human being. If you are stressed, not sleeping, 
you are not able to withstand the pressures of life. Some of you every five minutes you're ill. Mm. When I not want to sleep, get on a rest, stop stressing myself over everything. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I know exam coming up, but not be stressed over it. Just do the required work. And you'll be fine. So the same thing, our, our, our natural ecosystems would be able to adjust and adapt, but we are destroying them. There, there are too many stress to the stress of human stressors to the system. All right, so what's the response to the Jamaican government? What do you think the first presenter will say? <laughs> Not a thing. <laughs> Pure talk and promises. <laughs> All right, let's look at some little like evidence. This is really true. So Jamaica updated its natural determined contribution. So remember, each country is supposed to, uh, under the Paris Agreement, submit their emission. So Jam Jamaica is actually putting together a national adaptation plan. And remember, Vision 2030, goal four is Jamaica has a healthy natural environment. And an outcome of that is, is that hazard risk reduction and adaptation to climate change. So climate adaptation is built into Jamaica's Vision 2030. So we have a mitigation uh, policy. We have, we have the whole plan to reduce that. Um, recently, the Minister of Finance announced that coming to July 1, 2024, NHT contributors will be able to access loan to invest in solar panels, batteries, solar water heaters, etc. They can get up to 1.5 million as a single, but with joint, they can get up to $3 million. So that is, is present. Um, there's also a $360 million um, project that was funded by the British there's an organization um, there they call the, the Blue Carbon uh, Fund, the UK Blue Carbon Fund. They want to restore more than 1,000 hectares of degraded mango forests. This should be completed in 2026. Jamaica also had a tree planting initiative to plant one tree per individual. So three million trees were to be planted. And I think that was, I think we have not the three million. We have planted three million trees. But here's the thing about tree planting. How much of them still alive? <laughs> <laughs> I, was involved, I was involved in a project to plant trees. You plant the trees and there's a severe drought. Mm. They die. Yeah. You know so, I met so, uh, Go ahead. I was saying I met some of the, the blue carbon funders because they had like a, a forum at the hotel that I worked with. So they had to know a lot about blue carbon. And even at work, we have to practice the sustainability that they put in place. Excellent, excellent. So it's, it, it's not a myth, right? Mm. It's not a myth. It's true. You, it's true, because yeah. you have experienced that these things are happening. You see, I'm not making up story. <laughs> <laughs> no, there's evidence, there's evidence. So we have different initiatives. Um, so we have protected areas um, in the public country. So do you know, know that, know that communities can access funding whether it be through the Global Environment Fund, Small Grants Program, or through the, um, or from the EFJ, Environmental Foundation of Jamaica. So if you have a project, you can access funding to, to do work. So this, in Sawyer's, um, they, are, they have actually put up their own automatic weather station, and they are doing beekeeping and reforestation, and project management. So there is money. So when we talk about money being, it being too expensive, there are grants that persons can access to, to put these in place. And here we have another community um, intervention where they're doing a nursery um, in the Cockpit country. We have programs which are helping communities. Uh, this is up in the Blue and Drunker Mountain where they're helping them they're, they, with the fire brigade. They're training members in how to um, put up fire, set up fire breaks, etc to manage fire. Port and bite. You have persons who are, um, they have a fish sanctuary there. Persons are being trained in coral reef restoration. Coral nursery, Arco Bessie Bay doing the same thing. Uh, several years around Jamaica where they're restoring um, coral reef and wetlands. Um, note that five times, talk about blue carbon, five times as much organic carbon is stored by mango forests than in upland forests. 
So our man goes are very important. But what do we do in Montego Bay and other places on the North Coast? Right. The hotels need to be hello. <laughs> you all don't like, can you imagine you go to the beach and you have to walk through mango forest to get there? <laughs> no, <laughs> get rid of it. You are the first person who complain that we need to get rid of mangoes. Mm -mm. And the sea grasses as well. Nobody wants to walk. This is yucky. <laughs> With the sea heads, yes? I see that them instead of planting trees now in America, they're doing this this cyber algae the, um, tree planting. Have you seen it? Cyber algae? Yeah, like them, they, them putting it in like the algae in like a um, ah, glass. Yes. Oh, yeah. they, they, they have those projects where algae is supposed to be able to trap the carbon. But that's not shoreline protection. That is that is rich. So that is dealing with removing the carbon dioxide. For mangoes are nurseries for fish. The young fish go in there and they, 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 mangoes have more many more functions than just trapping carbon dioxide. Um, so it's it's so question. We have come to the end of the story. What will you do? Do better. <laughs> <laughs> so so the Davarti, um, so what is being done? Because even now we clear the, they're clearing the, the mangroves as we speak. Um, so what, what is being done to address that? See, there's a sad reality that government has policy, and then the action of the government goes totally opposite to policy. So we're supposed to be planting mangroves, and at the same time we're allowing persons to remove the mangroves. So there is a mix up. There's no, they, 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 our actions are not aligned with our policy direction. We say we want to do something, it's almost like you saying, I'm going to be a better person, and they walk down the road, they become smuddy. But in the debate, how do you strike the balance? Because they want to have a big highway from Kingston to Mobile. So, so, so when we're doing development projects, under the NRC Act, a permit is required. I'm here in Jamaica, supposed to have the pinnacle, these mm -hmm. massive right, right. Mm -hmm. high-rise buildings, and, I, and to date we don't see the impact assessment. Mm -hmm. We don't know what has been done. So the concern is, have we really considered the impact? Can we really? put up those higher, yes, it's a good concept, wonderful. Housing, um, diversified housing, and wonderful. <laughs> but the point is, can we really, what's the impact on sewage? Where are they gonna release the sewage? What's the impact with all of these persons? The, the, the pressure with traffic, it's a whole different thing that we consider, you know. Mm -hmm. Is it feasible? Unfortunately, for political expediency, I'm not blaming government, just, but this is how we tend to operate. We, 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 we shout, we're going to do this. And then the people behind the scenes are saying, Lord have mercy, what is our work? How is this going to work? And they are forced to come up with some fix that don't normally work. And then, so unfortunately, we, we, there is an approval process. There's a process you're supposed to go through. Announce it. The development is plan is put in place. The, re the relevant impact assessment is done. And you look at it and say, okay, fine. These mangroves are too important. We cannot do anything here. Leave these areas alone. There's another area which is not as sensitive. Let's do it there instead. We don't do that. We tend to throw those reports out through the window. And the higher people say, go ahead, full speed ahead, even though we're having a problem. They don't, they, and persons who work in government are constantly frustrated that they're ignored. Nobody listens to them um, in many instances, and they are forced to be implementing things that they know not going to work, and that they're going to have problems later on. And, but we, we really have to come to a point, as I say, where the, the, the balance, the balance really is there are some areas that are not as sensitive, that's where we should be developing. And areas which are sensitive, we leave them alone. So we should have more. So the government has, is always saying that they have declared more protected areas in the shortest period of time than anybody else has. But at the same time, we are still losing. Even in the protected areas, where still a lot of damage is occurring. 
because we're not enforcing. And sometimes government is, is the greatest um, challenge. We all, we all just need to look at Grimmel Town in Kingston. Why do we still have that dump that is on fire? The only way of the retirement dump. We have all of these dumps that are still not being managed properly. And uh, it's causing serious hazards to community members and the whole system. So do you feel like you can do anything? What can you do? Do better. Because I think, I think it's very simple students <laughs> now who are basically, everyone is looking to us now for the innovations to fix the problems. Who do we hold accountable when mm -hmm. our reports are not for held to any standard or the ecology studies that we put forward to say that this area should be left alone and that area should, should be used instead. Who do we hold accountable when our voices are ignored? <laughs> In Jamaica, you have to, as they say, block for wood. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> I think we should yeah. take KHS one, sir. You know, KHS yeah. resolution, man. That, that, was, that, was, that, was the, that was the first person. The second person will tell you, we have official channels. Do you know that within communities, we have what is known as CDCs, Com Community Development Committees. We have CDCs all over the place. The CDCs filter into the Parish Development Committees. So the parish development committee, so through your CDCs, if you have a concern, you should be able to bring it to the councillor and the NP through your parish development committees. And yes, they may get tired of you, but I don't think we, we always see on the news stories where persons block road. We tend not to see on the news. No, the stories where persons didn't block no road, but they work through the process and got the issue resolved. There are persons who are working out issues through the official channels and it's working, but we don't publicize these enough. Sir, question, how I find my CDC? Uh, Social Development Commission, the SDC, they are the one who, uh, and there's the Ministry of Local Government and Community Development, I think. So the SDC, Social Development Commission, falls onto the Ministry of Local Government and Community and, and the, yes, one of the sad realities of Jamaica, I found this. In some parishes, the SDC is working perfectly. In some places, is that they don't exist. And that's a case for almost every government organ agency. Some parishes, they're working and they're doing a whole lot. Others, it's like they don't exist. And so we really have to have a system where our, our, our citizens are forced. I, I went to a community in St. Thomas. And uh, when I went there, I talked to them about CDC, CDC. Who are you talking about? Yes, sir. That's, what, that's my face right now. SDC officer, SDC. What him so? <laughs> so I literally had to go to SDC and say, hello, there's a community here that don't know, no? Please come to this. I had to transport them. <laughs> so can transport me. I had to carry them to the community and introduce them. I know they're working beautifully. So there are some communities that are just lost. They're not on the system. Um, sir. Sir, which area is that? Because yeah. I know SDC is working all over in every area and every community. <laughs> <laughs> I would love to know which area that is. This was in 2018. Sir, my oh. area is right And it was in St. Thomas. Somewhere in St. Thomas. I that one in the place. But there was no SDC working that. What I, okay, well here's what happens sometimes with these agencies. Persons leave the position. Mm -hmm. And it, it's a vacant position, nobody's serving the community. So sometimes it's a transition between that causes a breakdown. And sometimes the new one don't know the work fully. And by the time the new one gets used to where they're supposed to be going and who they're supposed to be serving. I had an amazing story where there was this area being up, this community center being operated as a shelter. And when I went to SDC and said, are you responsible for the shelter? It's nowhere on our list. The shelter not on them list. <laughs> so we had to try and recognize and say, okay, so how how how, how they fit? Where do they fit? Um, 
and it has, so they are anomalies. The study system is not perfect, and so it really left out to us as communities, when in our community to find out if we are really connected in the system so that the official channels can work. Because there are many instances where there's a breakdown and so a whole community is lost from the system. They're just not anywhere. They don't fall into nobody. And, uh, and it really, the community shouldn't be sitting down there not knowing that, that they're out of the loop. They should be proactive and try to connect. Because when election time comes, everybody come around to them. So they, they should be saying, Hello, we not seen an STC person here. We not seen no body from RADA. We not seen anybody from so and so. Fix those things. We need those things fixed. We need to use our votes to get action. Mr. Martin, to go back a little bit, I know this. Um, Evan, you mentioned of the salt water getting into the aquifers and stuff like that. I don't know if you can. I think he's still here. Oh, um, right. I wanted to know, like, what. So we know that it's a negative impact, but how do we have an example of how it's made because All right, I lose my work. I lose my work. Where we get money from? Oh, wow. Some people said, I lose my work. I'm free. Period. I can pivot. And they are now so successful in doing what they know truly love. Because many of us get trapped in a job, you know, and we're afraid to leave. Afraid to fly. Yes, we're afraid. And the minute they say, you're fired. <laughs> yeah, you kind of feel a little, oh, yes. <coughs> with a bit, bit work with no paycheck. But as you start to sit down and you start to realize, oh, hold on, that's not what I really like in the first place. Let me know, ex uh, explore my dream. So there are persons who, when COVID-19 forced them to stay at home, they started blogs. They started all manner of things. They started online. They use things like, um, what's the online platform? We, 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 not necessarily TikTok. But the one where you can, people, you get work. You po people post LinkedIn. job, and you actually LinkedIn. post. LinkedIn. LinkedIn and so on is another one. Can't remember the name of it. Yeah. Um, but there is a, there's people out there who are searching for somebody to do stuff for them. And you being in Jamaica, it don't matter. It's online, so you can be doing assignments. Um, you can be doing projects online, right from your home. So lots of persons are now using this online um, access to be making lots of money. There, there, there are persons who want writers. There are persons who, there are lots of stuff that people want. And you are there with your capability. Don't have to take plane and run away. You stay at home and put up your profile and your track work. <clears throat> and if you do a good job, you get a good rating. And some persons are doing extremely well with that. Extremely well. But you know, somehow, no? no matter what opportunity they get, we're not going to mess it up. Sorry, not you. There's some persons, <laughs> there's some persons who know my, it, it, going overseas is supposed to be a wonderful opportunity. <coughs> but there are persons who go, go, go overseas and they fail. Made up. And there are others who, you ask the question, why is it that some people, no matter where you put them, they just fly. And other people, when you put them in the same system, they're just problems, problems, problems. <laughs> so we also have to adjust our mindset. Life is not how we want it. So we, therefore, have to be adaptable. Climate change adaptation. The world is changing. It is causing for us to be able to change. This is how many do it from a bond. <coughs> no, 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 no. That not going to cut it anymore. We have to adapt. This is how it's good. So you have to be innovators, constantly recognizing, looking to see where the world is going, mm -hmm. and put yourself in a position to, to meet that need. But sir, the world is going to, to stuff like bombing, Palestine, the whole um, Congo is dying movement. So what can we do about that? Who do we hold responsible? You remind me of Elijah. Good answer, sir. Elijah in the Bible. So after Elijah, you know, Elijah prayed to God and 
and God send down fire and burn up the sacrifice with water. <laughs> then Elijah, then Jezebel sent a threat and said, I'm going to kill you. And Elijah go to God and say, eh, no, no, Elijah, run away. And God have to say, wait, 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 me here run go. Period. And Elijah said, me tired. <laughs> and God said to him, say, um, God said to him, it's all right. You tired? So rest. But just make sure you appoint the next one. So Elijah took over. There is always people in the world who are doing good. There are always people in the world. So as much as you are seeing the world going to pieces, there are beautiful people like yourself that you need to find and network with. Who is that name is in the box? Yeah, um, so same to this cover that the star water and the water kind of they come together now and star water is taking over, right? Is there any research done to at least slow it down or any research done on how to actually preserve it or try to convert it back to fresh water? Well, thank you for actually mentioning that because one of the things that the, the government has done, uh, I think last year, year before, is that they've been pumping water into aquifers to store it. So that can help to, help to reverse the problem. So instead of allowing, so when rain falls, a lot of it runs off to the sea. But what you can do is instead of allowing it to run off to the sea, you can pump it into the aquifers to replace and push out the sea water. So they're actually, do, they're actually doing that. I think it's Innswood. I think it's Innswood is, is where they, they have a project where they do, they have that first project and, and they plan to do others elsewhere. But good point, yes. So you see, all right. One of the things we always are backs to the wall. There is no hope. There is nothing that we can do. No. There is always a solution. And one of the reasons why governments nowadays, governments said, okay, people, companies said we have to burn fossil fuels. There is no way. Think about it. Please. Please. I can't answer generally. There's a question on a serious note. If heat is affecting turtles, turn them to females. Does heat affect the testicles of men? Soy, soy milk. So what causes sterility? No, that soy milk affects how um the, the gender of a male, you know, at, at a tender age. That is why mothers should not eat kids or males on soy milk. Excellent. But we're talking about heat here. We're talking about heat here. There, 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 there's a reason why the testicles drop down from the body. To remain cool. So you say, when you wear the tight up, tight up pants them? Yes, man. Talk to them, sir. The tight up, tight up pants them. It's not pants, sir, at this time. It's, it's, it's tight at this point. Put the pants again. Tell them, sir, stop wearing tights. It can affect the body. It's important. It's important. Anything so much. Okay, okay, that's a very interesting. Don't look at me. All right, at this time, we will call on Miss Kiraya Richards to do the vote of that. Get them, Kiraya. Get them, Kiraya. Get them, Richards. It's a doctor that could sit there. Oh. I think she can hear it. Hello everybody. <laughs> Good day, Kira. Hello my classmates and Hi. my admin staff. Hello everybody. So I'm honored to be here today to express our deepest appreciation to our distinguished teachers for their informative and inspiring presentations on climate change. Firstly, I would like to thank Mr. Evan Tauzu on the screen. Thank you. So, thank you. Uh, Mr. Evan Tauzu is a meteorologist and the principal director of the meteorological branch. Your insights into the science of climate change were invaluable, and your passion for this issue is contagious. A special thank you goes out to Mr. Raymond Martin, our very own. 
<laughs> our very own lecturer here at USEC. Your innovative approach to delivering information in such a captivating manner is truly commendable. You're, you're very funny, okay? <laughs> So by actively engaging your audience, you have not only entertained us, but also imparted invaluable lessons that will undoubtedly last a lifetime. Because I was now on you know, saying that um, greenhouse gas is a chip in the ozone. Thank you for correcting me and informing the others. Okay. It is clear that we need to take action to address this issue and your work is helping to raise awareness about the importance of doing so. And guys, you really start to sense like that if we do like little, little things to help combat climate change, it can work. But what are you to tell you a great tip that perfume and all of that affects the climate and it co contributes to climate change? It does. But we maybe just say, oh, it's such a small thing, you know, we're gonna change nothing, but it starts with us, you know? Cause imagine if, if everybody in the world has to use certain things, you know? <laughs> anyway, <laughs> anyways, we'd like to thank a Streamline Media for skillfully capturing these enlightening moments in real time and allowing us to revisit and share them through the lens of your expertise. Your effort... <laughs> Yes, uh, thanks for coming out, everybody. Of course, sir. 